Iran helped Americans reach Kabul. Without the help of Iran, Americans would have been fighting for another three years before winning against Taliban in 2001. And then what happened in Bonn conference? Again, Iran, and that was Javad Zarif as Iran's representative there, Iran helped uh, Karzai to become the president of Afghanistan, an unknown man that the West was like pushing it, but the Mujahideen and factions close to Iran didn't want him. So again, Iran helped that. That's, that's December 2001. And what happened on 22nd of January, 2000, or 29th of January, 2002, which is like 35 days later, George Bush called Iran alongside Iraq and North Korea axis of evil. And that was like the beginning of intensification of pressure on Iran. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And tonight I'm joined by the wonderful Iranian political analyst, Ali Ali Sadeh, who is based in London and runs Jedal, a media initiative working mainly in Persian and analyzing especially Iranian politics, internal and external, for his uh, for his viewership. And um, tonight he will talk to us in English. Ali Ali Sadeh, welcome to the channel. Hi, Pascal. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, thanks for uh, giving me the chance to demystify some of these endless mystification around Iran and its uh, internal and uh, foreign policy. That's exactly what I would like you to do. I've been looking for an Iran expert who can speak uh, his mind and also like connect the dots for a while. And I found you. So could you maybe start with giving us a little bit of background on, on Iran's internal politics. So there have been several coups and there have been several people in power and we will talk about Raisi and so on later. But what is most pivotal in order for our viewership to understand how Iran's political process works? Okay, uh, because I believe what is on the facade and on the outer layer of the Iran discourse in the international politics and international media is... Uh, question of democratization, the breaches of human rights by the state, imprisonment of human rights activists, women rights activists, ethnic activists, etc. But then I believe if we <laughs> scratch the surface underneath, we are dealing with the questions of geopolitical rivalries of the West with Iran and the demands of the Western uh, powers in West Asia, what is used to be called Middle East. And so I believe the normal, ordinary audience will benefit much more to understand the basis and the real political foundation of this rivalry, of this battle between Iran and the West, uh, rather than the surface. I'm not saying that the Iranian young people are not part of them looking for more freedom. I'm not saying that the democracy sentiments are not as strong among part of the population, but I'm saying that these are always being abused by the by the Western media to uh, to somehow engage our sentiments and take hostage from our feeling in order to then push their own <laughs> push their own uh, political interest, the political interest of Washington and uh, London and EU and other places. Yeah. So what is it that um, that is important to understand? Because one of the things is that often we, we tend to think of Iran as a unitary actor and everything is under under uh, the, the, the great leader uh, Khomeini. And that's utterly dumb. I mean, Iran is a quite a pluralistic society in, in also the way it, it works politically. Can we maybe start with the different power centers inside Iran who are important for its foreign policy making? Excellent question. I think, let me just, uh, in order to understand Iran, it would be possibly better to do a bit of genealogical study of mm -hmm. how Iran's current position sure. has come to existence. And I think that will give us a better option. Uh, I, I'm more focused on like foreign policy at the moment, but I will take you to the internal dynamic mm -hmm. as well. So the 
current from the Iranian state, as we understand, the first Iranian state in modern world and modern time, um, in a shape of like modern nation state, comes to existence in 1979. Before, yes, in Pahlavi era, you have about 57 years of a state which was imposed somehow first by British Empire in 1921-22, and then later on after the, the Allies entered Iran in 1941, and they reimposed Pahlavi's son, Mohammad Reza. Uh, so very soon, Iran again uh, got somehow lost its independence by 1953 coup uh, organized by CIA and MI6 as uh, documented. Uh, so Iran never had that independent state which was capable of uh, taking its decisions inside Iran rather than outside. And in, before that, in Qajar dynasty in 19th century, Iran was a uh, place for uh, buffer zones for Russian Empire, British Empire. And so it was a weak, it was too weak of a state to be able to talk about it as a modern state. Uh, so, so from 79, whether we like the Islamic government or not, it is uh, the existence, it is the embryonic stages of a modern nation state. So the word modern, people don't like the next put it next to Islamic. But if you again take a, take the surface away of the ideology and of the claims of the states towards Islamization, etc., underneath what you see are like the calculations and the uh, the, the everyday dealings of a of a nation state with its own contradictions and its own limitations and its own aspirations, et cetera. But let's go back to 1979, when it's associated with lots of zealotry, with lots of like radicalization, hostage taking of American embassy for 444 days. But I would say, instead of focusing on these things, let's just focus on the situation in 79. It was West-East divide. It was the height of Cold War. And it was a time that Iranian revolutionaries, possibly intuitively and instinctively, saw the opportunity for carving a space for, you say you call it neutrality in your channel, I would call it for third way. And that's why if you go to Tehran and if you go to Iranian foreign ministry, which until very recently was run by Mr. Javad Zarif, on the very top of it, there is a tile and the entrance of it, and it says, Nasharqi Nagarbi Jumhuri Islami, neither the East nor the West, but Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. That explains Iran's foreign policy. They were trying to not fall into the Eastern bloc of Soviet uh, countries, especially given the strength of the Marxist organization inside Iran, and also the fact that at the time, just to remind the younger audience, Iran had about 2,000 kilometers of common border with Soviet Union in the north, because instead of Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Turkmenistan, they were all Soviet Union. So falling into uh, Soviet empire and being co-opted into it through a red rev revolution inside Iran was a genuine fear. It's the same time that Soviet tanks entered Afghanistan. So it was a genuine fear. And also Shah and Pahlavi era, Pahlavi dynasty, they were directly working with the United States and they were basically a uh, client state of America. Yeah. And, and, le and sorry, and less than less than 40 years earlier, the Iran got actually invaded by a coalition of the Soviet Union and the British, right? While Iran and was Americans. trying to stay neutral between, between and Americans. So there was a, a very clear uh, uh, consciousness, probably, for the vulnerability of, of being squeezed. Um, and then the, the thing, though, is that between... And also, so... part, and also part of Iran, Azerbaijan, which yeah. is a very important part of the country, was almost like, uh, with the help of Soviets, uh, moving towards uh, asking independence and separating from Iran. So, in a sense, the fear of Soviets it was, was not uh, was not uh, paranoia by the, by the Iranian new revolutionaries and Islam, uh, by, by Islamists. They, exactly, as you saw, as, as you said, they were invited by Soviet uh, troops, they were invaded by the Western troops. So this fear of neither the West nor the East would allow a space for an independent Iranian state existed there very much. Yeah, and, and also the Mossadegh 
uh, government that came to power through like democratic uh, elections right after the Second World War was a very po was a very uh, popular one, right? The, the then imposed regime after fifty three uh, by the Shah was unpopular, and unpopular enough to galvanize the. The, the 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 Islamist forces with the revolutionary forces, which were not the same, as far as I understand. And then came the seventy nine revolution. And how did then Iran move forward from there? Because it was two unlikely uh, forces that joined against the Shah, right? I mean, so I agree with that. There were multiplicity of forces. There were Marxists. There were nationalists. There were hybrid versions of Marxist, socialist, Islamist like Mujahideen Khalq. So it was a variety. It was a laboratory of different uh, political forces which came to the uh, to the historical stage of 1979. But having said that, you should one one should not undermine the upper hand that the Islamists had, and especially Ayatollah Khomeini had, as Ayatollah Khomeini had, the, the leader of revolution, and his charismatic role in reaching out to the hearts and minds of the population. So uh, again, I mean, I would I would take you to this uh, famous saying by Michel Foucault, which says Khomeini is the focal point of the general will of Iranian people. I'm not saying that this is true. It might be, as people claim, the result of Michel Foucault's enthusiasm and um, being too overexcited, but it would show that I mean, how Khomeini's role was envisaged at the time. So, in a sense, we should not read the history backward and saying that these like other organizations had too much role in terms of number, in terms of uh, the reach, in terms of organization. Islamists with the ne network of mosques, with the power of bazaar, all of these are like the traditional institutions in Iran, which uh, have been there for. Uh, hundreds of years. So they, they were much more rooted and embedded in the native Iranian society. And I think that's why they managed to uh, win through the battle of uh, the post revolutionary battle of hegemony. But let's just move on from 79. So what happens in 79? It's Khomeini comes, and in Paris, he even sends, gives some uh, green signals to Americans that our state will not uh, show enmity towards America. But coming inside the country, there was a fear of American coup against the revolutionary state. And this fear, again, was the result of the genuine trauma of 1953. America was seen big, powerful, almighty, Omni, uh, omnipotent and omnipresent. So it it was seen as capable of any moment turning the side and making a coup d'état against the regime, against against the revolutionary state, and bringing the Shah back. So very soon after the revolution, uh, a group of Marxist guerrilla organization try to attack American embassy, that the Islamists take them back and they defend American embassy. But they themselves, about nine months later, in October 79, they attack American embassy. So, and I think this has been like, I don't know, for 45 years, people have been uh, doing different analysis of it and different stories and uh, mystification. But I think the, the need for that was in the heart and minds of people. So whoever could do it fast, whoever could do it before other groups would win in the battle of hegemony inside the state building in the uh, in Iran. So you, whoever could like take hostages and take American embassy would be seen as superior in the minds of people in a very fragile balance of power. So that's what uh, Islamists did. Khomeini at the beginning didn't endorse. Two days later, or like 24 hours later, he changed mind and uh, and he endorsed it and then became the beginning of this uh, massive rift between Iran, Iran and America, a massive uh, 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 fissure which got bigger and bigger and bigger. So we go to the next stage, which is like Iran and Iraq war in 80s. And again, Iraq famously was closer to Soviet bloc alongside uh, uh, maybe like Syria, uh, maybe Syria uh, and also like Nasser's Egypt, yeah. So in that division between East and Western Bloc, and and Iran was closer to America. So when the war started, Iraq traditionally benefited from continuation of 
Soviets help in military and and some form of information, but also Americans famously helped Iraq, as been documented by foreign policy and others, that they gave them a lot of information on how to uh, throw chemical bombs on Iran. And so in the 80s, Iran was very lonely, very isolated. The only one friend they had was Basis party of ba Basis Syria of Hafez Assad. Very interesting. And that was not easy as well. So there's no kind of relationship that we see between Iran and Syria today. Because the old guard of Ba'ath Party were very pro-Soviet and they were very skeptical of any form of Islamist movement. They had killed tens of thousands of people in homes, I think, uh, and, uh, in 1983, the Ikhwan al-Muslimin and Muslim Brotherhood. They didn't like this Islamization. They saw... They saw this Islamization as a threat, so they didn't. They looked at Khomeini with a lot of suspicion. But Hafez Assad himself saw Saddam as a more dangerous party. So, again, Syria was the only friend Iran had over eight years of isolation by the Arab League, by part of the Islamic countries, and by the West, and also by the East. And that's very foundational moment in Iran. I believe is Kenneth Walt, who has written this wonderful article saying that the country's foreign policy is the outcome of the last biggest war and mm -hmm. that last biggest national war. The same way that uh, Russia's foreign policy regarding its eastern borders, it's like western borders, is the result of losing 20 million of its young uh, soldiers in Second World War uh, to Nazis. And so Russians never want to have direct border with the enemy on the West border, uh, on the West side, because of the flatness of uh, Central Europe. Same way that Kenneth Walt says Iran's loneliness and isolation in the 80s uh, was hard etched into their national consciousness and will force them to uh, rely on themselves militaristically. And that's why whatever you do to Iran, whether you put sanctions on Iran, whether you invade them, they will continue making their missiles, they will continue making their weaponry. Because in the 80s, they could not import barbed wire, famously. They could not buy bullets for normal guns, let alone buying missiles, let alone buying uh, uh, battleships, let alone buying aeroplanes, etc., etc. So, so in a sense, that's an important thing to understand in regarding Iran's part of Iran's foreign policy and national uh, security part, uh, uh, doctrine. So independence in building your weaponry and building your uh, military equipment, because you, no one helps Iran. Yeah, so self-sufficiency is in a sense baked into the consciousness of a lot of Iranian uh, um, policy makers, right? Trying to do things on your own as far as you can, as you have access to raw materials. Because from uh, <laughs> because because from like 1980, you've been experiencing some sort of sanctions. Hmm. Because from 1980, you didn't have access to free market to go and buy what you want, while your neighbors in Saudi, in Qatar, in Emirates, in Pakistan, in Turkey, in Iraq, they could go and buy whatever they wanted. You couldn't do anything. So, <laughs> so in a sense, that's 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 the reason for that, and that's why it became so important. Now, so may, maybe I'm jumping a little bit too much now, and tell me if you want to go back. But to me, this seems like Iran has had to learn a lesson which uh, Russia and others are now going through that if you're being if the West tries to isolate you completely isolate you you have to do it on your own and Russia actually proves that it is able to do it at the moment on its own and I Iran always like was forced to do that way before uh, it had like the the big industrial base the way that Russia or the Soviet Union had at the time right so do you think that this actually now puts Iran into a better position of dealing with this new order that we are coming into because uni uh, unipolarity is over I think we all agree on that um, what is this doing to Iran's position at the moment this this history of having to be somehow self sufficient okay excellent question. <laughs> I think Iran is the pioneer and the avant-garde in the field mm -hmm. of being self-sufficient. And also, 
Iran is a laboratory for West to work on its weapon, economic weapon called sanctions. Mm. So every sanction that you see is imposed on Russia at the moment or Venezuela or Nicaragua or other places has been tested on Iran before. So, uh, but, so the but they all have failed of... in Iran. So why do they do it again? But there's a different question. I mean, Iran has 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 come over a lot of these uh, sanctions, right? Well, has, that's the story actually I want to tell today. They have failed and not failed. They failed in doing regime change. They failed in bringing Iran to its knees. But they have not failed in hampering Iran's development. They have not failed in exhausting Iran as a nation state. They have not failed in uh, weaponizing the internal conflict and the internal uh, discontent inside the country. They have not failed in widening the gap between the state and part of the population. So in a sense, they have been, if you sell the sanctions as... <clears throat> A weapon of war to destroy Iran, yes, they have failed. But if you look at them as uh, instrument of de-development of Iran mm. and putting pressure on a third world country, which is trying to be independent and a role model for other global South countries, I think they have been not 100% failed. And I want to talk about that, especially we have to look at them in relation to the factional fight inside Iran. But let me just take you to the second point, historical point, seminal point, and that's 1989. 1989 is when Ayatollah Khomeini dies in, in June. Why is it important? Because he was the, not Arbeiter, he was the, abs he was the absolute uh, judge in the factional fight between the right-wingers, left-wingers, the Islamist left and Islamist right. Yeah? And so he could like keep the state together and from from its many crises, because he was a charismatic leader who was looked up to both by a big part of the population at the time and also by everyone inside the state. He's gone. Second, the war has changed, has finished, and the war could somehow absorb part of the criticism, etc., and has left Iran with famously one trillion dollar of loss and and damages. And third thing is, 1989 is the beginning of the official announcement of the new world order, as you call it, unipolarity. And where does this new world order uh, do its first uh, show? Where does, it, where does it do its, uh, what's the word? Um, the first Iraq war. Hmm. Its, its first manifestation. Man, first, first manifestation, like a new product, is in Gulf, the uh, Persian Gulf area. It's in uh, next to Iran is the Iraq war. Yeah, is the first Persian Gulf War in 1990. Yeah, and so that again is very important. So Iranians live, who started from neither the West nor the East see themselves thrown into a unipolar world order, which actually its first most urgent act is to destroy this region of West Asia, and so the. Troop after troop is coming to the uh, to the Persian Gulf. That's when American bases are made in Saudi. They are made in Qatar. They are made in Bahrain. They are made in Emirates. Suddenly, this whole area, about some of them about 150, 200 kilometers away from Iranian border, highly are filled yeah. with highly militarized with like tens of thousands of American troops. And then those like amazing ultra red imagery that CNN was uh, publicizing that they can push a button in Washington and then a part of Baghdad is boom, is exploded. So that is the very important moment. So why is it important? From that moment, they say uh, Iranian radicals, fundamentalists, the rogue state, they don't want to work. No, from that moment, actually, Iranians have been doing, and even before that, from 1986, possibly, from McFarlane uh, 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 crisis and Iran Gate, Iran has always been looking to do some form of detente with America. And my my thesis is America was too powerful to do a detente for us with a small, weak country like Iran. America didn't want that. In 19, if I'm not mistaken, 91, 92, Rafsanjani, the president of Iran at the time, he helped 
releasing of Israeli and American soldiers, uh, hostages in Lebanon. George Bush, the father, had promised to do something in return for Iran, and that, would, that could have been the beginning of a form of normalization, and Bush did not deliver. Yeah? So who the, who the hell are you? I, I, I give you nothing. Yeah? Either you surrender or nothing. You go further, you come to Bill Clinton, and, and then... Is the beginning of is the beginning of globalization? Nineties. Iran's Iranians are begging for joining WTO. I think Iran has applied thirty two times to join WTO. Thirty two times, and they got failed every time. So, the government after Khomeini does this U turn, not U turn. It's like this. Uh, 180 degree turn and they are looking at the Chinese model, post Mao Chinese model that we need Iranian capitalism we need to open the global market and we need to normalize the relationship with the West slowly Rafsanjani is the symbol of this faction yeah? and he's very strong at the time, he's the number one person in the country and he, he's, this, he's, he's given nothing by, by the West in terms of economic initiatives. So the first four years that he even does famously is called a structural adjustment policy yeah, in line with IMF. And what I call is, <laughs> I, I've labeled this neoliberalism without any benefit. Because yeah. in neoliberalism, you are damaging your domestic markets, but at least Global investment is coming here because of America and America's pressure on Iran. No foreign investment came. And then at the same time, they destroyed uh, the domestic social welfare and they created a lot of discontent. After four years, Iran is seeing riot after riot by the poor section, by the downtrodden, yeah, and they back off from a structural adjustment. 1997, the reformists come to power in Iran. The reformists who were the radicals of 80s, they come with the incentive, they, they come with the promise of normalization of relationship with the West. Khatami, Iran's president, his main line is dialogue among civilization in order to counter the Huntingtonian uh, uh, f uh, war among civilization and uh, the battle of civilizations. So he's coming with a branch of olive in his hand in order to create a detente. Clinton, of course, on the surface, he apologized for 1953 coup. He does do some sweet talking, but then look behind the scene. Clinton era and Khatam is a time that uh, sanctions after sanctions for the first time are coming to, to Senate and Congress. Pistachio, carpet from Iran. Then you have, I think, Damato and then Helms Burton. I'm not sure which one was for Libya and which one was for Iran. And other sanctions. Sanctions on Iran's oil industry. And then they're like really putting pressure on Iran. So inside Iran as well, part of the state is worried about this. They think we are being surrounded by American forces. So Khamenei, current leader, he goes the, the different direction from Rafsanjani. He's actually investing more on insurgency, on helping the uh, asymmetrical regional warfare, helping Hezbollah, helping the uh, guerrilla uh, organizations like Hamas in, resistance organization like Hamas in, in Palestine. Right. And and then he's he's worried and he thinks that we cannot we cannot gamble with our national security. Iran is on is in line to be the country after Iraq possibly. We are talking like mid mid nineties. So so this this debate and this battle also exists inside the country. But what I'm saying is, on despite what we are told by the Western media, it wasn't Khamenei or it was not IRGC. Uh, Islamic Republic Revolutionary Guard. They were not the parties who hampered normalization of relationship with the West. It was Washington. It was the Israeli lobbies from early 90s who were pushing Washington to create more enmity with Iran. And also uh, it was the fact that America was seeing itself as absolute power. So yeah. not making any compromise towards a weak country like Iran. Question, though, um, I, of course, I mean, if anyone looks at the, the distribution of U.S. bases in West Asia, I mean, you get this, you, you clearly get a sense for being surrounded if you're in Iran. But there's these two factors that I don't quite understand. Uh, one is the, 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 the uh, adversarial relationship first with Iraq. 
And secondly, the adversarial relationship with Saudi Arabia. How come that under Hussein Iraq and under the Saudi uh, monarchy, there was never any kind of rapprochement um, between Iran and those two and those two states? And you know, Iraq only vanished as a problem for Iran after actually the U.S. invaded for the second time, right? And kind of destroyed that that uh, the the way that Iraq existed before. What are these two states in 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 the local geopolitics from an Iranian point of view? I mean, just look at the look at the oil production. Saudi is the biggest producer of the oil. Iraq was the second biggest producer of the oil in the world, and Iran was the third. Yeah. So you go back to like mid seventies. All these three countries, I mean, from geopolitical point of view, from like the internal mechanisms of a state, you would think. Who were like Saudis to think they are the boss of the region, or who were like Iraqis, or who were like Shah's Iran? I mean, there's no technology, there is no, there's no power. But because of the oil prices, I think all these three parties were, were quite ambitious in being the main power in the region. So in a sense, don't look at Iraq as a broken country in 90s or like, so Saudi in 73 could basically change the uh, balance of power by not selling oil to the West and by sanctioning the oil, yeah? So, and and changing the power of like uh, Israel-Arab Arab wars. So when 1979 happened, famously some uh, Sunni Islamists, uh, if I'm not mistaken, inspired by Iranian revolution, they went and they took hostage in Mecca. And then Saudis were, they felt existential threat by a similar Islamic revolution inside their own country. And so that's why the concept of exporting revolution, Iranians exporting revolution, became like a very frequent term used, used at the time. Uh, because look at that, the biggest ally of United States in the region, which was Pahlavi, Iran, was destroyed by these mullahs. So why not doing the same in Saudi? Yeah? So in a sense, the fear was there, the fear was there, and part of enmity was there. Uh, and that was like rooted in their own insecurity, because it's a small uh, family who's running the country in in, in Saudi. So it's not a state in the sense of like, I don't know, how, how we understand it. I think that was part of it. And they, the Iranian revolutionaries were possibly a bit like ruthless. If the revolutionaries in Saudi wanted help, I'm sure Iranians would have sent them uh, help and weapon and, 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 and other things at the time. And Iraq is different. Iraq and Iran had border issues with each other. And they, they do have conflict. Saddam saw the opportunity Saddam saw the opportunity to uh, basically to use this moment of Iran's weakness. Iran was in the middle of factional fight after revolution. Iran had a lot of region, uh, ethnic uh, civil wars inside the country, in the Kurdish area, area in the Baluch area, in the kind of Turkmen area. So the state was not uh, was not solidified yet in 1980 when Saddam attacked Iran. The state was not was not there yet. Yeah, so it's like one and a half years after revolution. It was weak. They had killed many of the generals of the army in the fear of they being too close to Shah regime and to the ancient regime, and they might do a coup. So the army was weak. Iran as a state was weak, and Saddam was encouraged to do so as to become the leader of Arab world, to put his, his feet on the shoes of Saad, uh, uh, Nasser. And, and also... Iran is not Arab country, so again, I mean, they were all like the, the, the this Shiite revolution uh, could is could could be like sold as as a threat to Arab identity and Arab nationalism. So as well, in a sense, the fact that the war started was not uh, very strange, and also Iranians were a bit careless, not understanding the threats of war, what what it means for them, and not understanding like international relations, diplomacy, and how to avoid and how to stop it early enough. So that's that's two things. But unlike what you said, Iran went for rapprochement. Very soon after the end of war in 1988, Iran and Iraq started doing rapprochement. The relationship, uh, the relationship improved uh, to some extent. Iranians were going to Iraq, coming back. And I think... They were close enough that in 2003, when America was going to attack Iraq, Saddam sent all his airplanes 
to to shelters in Iran. So they were not that far away from each other. And also Rafsanjani did a rapprochement with Saudi in mid 90s, yeah, in mid 90s, and with uh, Abdullah. And I think the relationship improved a lot as well back then. Yeah, and and maybe to interject here, I do think Iran, especially from when I started observing it, which was like sometimes in the 2000s, just before it was, I mean, it was too young to 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 think about it. But I I I under I, I get this in perception of Iran at, at actually being very good at rapprochement politics and at at striking deals with with adversaries and we've seen that in 2016 when Iran made this gr this great uh, deal with with the Obama administration for normalization which then was torn apart later with uh, by 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 Donald Trump we've seen this in the way that Iran reacted to to Things that in any other circumstance was had, would have led immediately to war, like the assassination of Mr. Soleimani, like an attack on its on its embassy, and how how Iran is very skilled at 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 uh, answers, proportional answers that that keep things under the level of war, and also recently by uh, agreeing to this Chinese proposal of of normalization with ties with Saudi Arabia. Um, and I'm sorry, we are now uh, clearly in, in in current politics. Where do you see Iranian uh, this this like Iran's foreign policy move from here, where actually rapprochement has happened, and Iran managed to put down its foot against an something that you know an Israeli-Iranian war was around the corner, and it didn't happen also because of the way that Iran acted and uh, on the battlefield and diplomatically. Where do you see current affairs? Okay, that's a very interesting point that you said, because, again, that's rooted in the trauma of Iran's last biggest national war, that eight years war in which Iran lost with empty hands and lost 220,000 of its young boys. So for that reason, Iran is the most pacifist country in the world. So despite what they show and what they say about Iran, they, even you go up to the generals of Revolutionary Guard, they don't want the war. They want weapon. So you say they might want nuclear weapon. I don't know, maybe maybe they want it or uh, they, they will have it tomorrow. They, they will have everything as deterrent, but they don't want to have an all... Uh, uh, they don't want to use it. Proper, they don't have a proper war in the sense that it can like take the country for years and it comes to the streets and countries, uh, the cities of the country. So, so that's the important thing. Iran has done everything from 1988 not to have another war inside its own its own land, and that 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 is rooted in that very foundational uh, traumatic moment. So, so that's why you know Iran will actually do rapprochement with many countries, despite what you think. So, so with Saudi Arabia despite all the all the rhetoric between the two countries and despite all the rhetoric from Saudi against Iran. I mean, remember what uh, Ben Salman said, said we will take the war into the streets of Iranian cities. I think that was 2017, yeah? And, his, and Ben Salman's giving $400 billion worth of contract to Trump in uh, end of May or early June of 2020, uh, 2017 was again for bringing and dragging Trump into uh, into uh, in intensifying uh, fight with Iran. So Saudi did all these things, but when the moment came for Iran, which is somehow around October 2019, after either Iranians or Yemenis attacked. Uh, uh, the uh, the oil facilities in in uh, in Saudi. Uh, you have to help me here yeah. with my uh, foggy foggy uh, memory. Um, uh, when, yeah, when in, the, in, the, in, the, in the south of of Saudi Arabia, there was this big oil Australia, refinery the, the biggest, that got blown the, the, up. Yeah, um, the, the biggest the biggest Saudi oil company. Um, uh, that was that was right before the whole Aramco the whole with, tanker when, when, crisis when the, when the, started. Yeah. That's what, no, no. When when they bombed Aramco in end of September 2019, yeah. I think Saudis backed off as well. Saudis backed off, and I think that was the time that a rapprochement became possible. That's why Qasem Soleimani went to Baghdad in, uh, I believe, is third of January 2000. Yeah. Uh, 
2020, and he was he was there invited uh, by Iraqis to sit down with Saudi counterparts and talk about rapprochement. Trump intervened, and that uh, assassination sabotage that possibility and then the both states stayed stand by until until March 2023 yeah but then the tension between Iran and Saudi was like almost frozen in that three years yeah it was kept a standby and, and nothing happened in that time so so in a sense Iranians uh, are not are not interested in opening more fronts to war because two reasons one they are they are desperate for internal economic development and they want more foreign investment, they want security. But as I said, they are not willing to compromise on the national security. Yeah? So if it's just possible, very quickly, I'll take you back from 2000, from like mid 90s to, to, to here, and then I open up myself to your questions. So two factions inside Iran come to existence, Khamenei and Revolutionary Guard faction, and reformists and Rafsanjanis and and the, somehow they, what we call them pro-Western faction. Yeah? So, there are endless debate until today. What shall we do with America? Shall we like go for rapprochement? Shall we go and sit down for negotiation? Shall we give up nuclear? Shall we give up missile in, in, in the hope that America will give us some compromise, lift the sanction? This has been this these two factions have been fighting with each other. They're in inside the country, this fighting has been translated in the name of democracy movement in the uh, one side is being called authoritarian which possibly they are and the other side are much more technocratic they are also culturally more open but i believe the real fight has been for the question of foreign policy what are we going to do with america yeah? and and i think the, the the destiny of this internal dynamic and internal fight was more influenced by america because American side, somehow instead of helping the pro-Western faction in Iran, it really slapped them in the face, not once, so many times. First time, Khatami, as I said, wrote the olive branch, dialogue among civilization. What did America do? In Bonn conference, Iran in, 2020, in 2001, mm -hmm. Iran helped Americans reach Kabul. Without the help of Iran, Americans would have been fighting for another three years before winning against Taliban in 2001. And then what happened in Bonn conference? Again, Iran, and that was Javad Zarif as Iran's representative there, Iran helped uh, Karzai to become the president of Afghanistan, an unknown man that the West was like pushing it, but the Mujahideen and factions close to Iran didn't want him. So again, Iran helped that. That's, that's December 2001. And what happened on 22nd of January, 2000, or 29th of January, 2002, which is like 35 days later, George Bush called Iran alongside Iraq and North Korea axis of evil. And that was like the beginning of intensification of pressure on Iran. So in a year later, yes, I mean, everyone says America got rid of Saddam and Taliban for Iran. Yeah, but at the same time, you have 150,000 soldiers on your eastern border in Afghanistan and 200,000 soldiers on your western border with Iraq. So you have 1,300 kilometers of border with America in your western side and 905 kilometers of border with America on your eastern side. And the whole of Persian Gulf is filled with American base after American base, American Navy ship after American Navy ship. So uh, so in a sense, I think I always say that, I say like this, like Woody Allen, uh, famous line that says, it's true that I'm paranoid, but doesn't mean that someone is not following me. And America was following Iran. America was really pushing Iran. So in a sense, that was the reason that the pro-reform and pro-Western faction in Iran <laughs> was uh, suppressed by the other side. And that was the result of the election of someone like Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2005. And the um, tilt in Iran towards the East, tilt towards more radicalization, and tilt towards more uh, national security and, and closer tie between Iran and the resistance movement in Iraq resistance movement in Lebanon, and also possibly, and for that we need to wait a couple of years before the documents come, 
and also Iran's getting closer to Taliban in 2007 onward. Yeah? So, so in a sense, Iran, I think out of intu intuition and again out of instinct, Iran tried to push America out of its neighborhood, which is like, I think it's the reason of a state. It's not, nothing to do with ideology. It's nothing to do with Islam. It's nothing to do with Shiism. It's nothing to do with like zealotry, radicalization. It's like basic instinct for survival of a state which sees itself surrounded everywhere. Oh, I didn't say Turkey. The other part, 1,300 kilometer border with Iraq, and then another like 1,000 kilometer with Turkey, which is the second biggest NATO army in the yeah. world. Yeah, and you no, know, no, I... I... This is not any kind of conspiracy theory here. I remember very clearly um, how, in especially after 2003, like everybody was expecting that Iran would be the next Iraq, that, you know, Iraq is, is a gateway to actually then have for the for the US to have a, have a war with Iran. That was maybe that was not based upon uh, 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 serious strategic calculations at the time, but that was a that was a national that was a, a perception at the time in the West, and it even went all the way to Switzerland. I remember even you know popular uh, comedy shows from the US saying after the i you know it was the time when the iPhone and the iPod became quite big, and there was this joke of like the Iraq Iraq and the Iraq, and then after the Iraq collapses, the next the next goal uh, is going to be the Iran, and then you have a shoe with an eye on it, and it was a stupid joke, but. There was there was popular perception that that you know Iran is probably going to be next in line, and then Iran didn't happen. But a lot of other uh, states in West Asia, a lot of them, Libya and Syria and so on, like uh, bit by bit, got dismantled. Um, so I do not think that Iran needs to be uh, paranoid in order to be worried about what Western alliances were doing at the time in this region. Um, just just to 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 interject that here. Uh, I think the beauty of, is a, no, is a, is an important intervention by Wesley Clark as early as 22nd of September 2003. People can find that on Al Jazeera, which says U.S. plans to attack seven Muslim states. Yeah? Mm. And Wesley Clark, who I think was the head of NATO at the time, he recalls a meeting he had with um, uh, Rumsfeld, in which Rumsfeld shows him plans to attack seven countries, uh, Iraq, Somalia, Syria, Libya, Yemen, Lebanon, and at the very end of them is Iran. So Iran was supposed to be the very uh, uh, top crown of the jewel. cake at the end. Mm -hmm. So the uh, crown jewel, yeah. So after you attack all of them and you weaken the region and you turn the whole region into, into a wasteland, then you go for Iran. And I think, I think in a sense, Iran uh, saw the kind of called the bluff. And so, yes, uh, it it helped the kind of it helped the uh, Iraqi groups and uh, guerrilla movement to uh, to fight against American soldiers and uh, so it contributed to that civil war in Iraq. But then uh, then Syria started one after another. But let me just take you to the final part, and I stop. So despite all these things, Ahmadinejad four years between 2005 and 2009, he, lots of things happened. The nuclear power developed in Iran. Uh, Iran's missile activity flourished in that time. Hezbollah won, almost won a war in 33 days war against Israel in summer 2006. Yeah? It was very important. Al Ahmadinejad went to the region and uh, went to Lebanon and was like greeted as no one has ever been greeted before. Yeah? So, and then Iran started taking his eggs away from West, Western baskets. Because one thing you need to understand, it's true that part of the Revolutionary Guard, part of the military strategies in Iran and thinkers and decision makers, they are, in terms of national security, they want to move away from the West. But Iran's capitalism still is mainly entangled with the Western companies, with Western markets. <coughs> Traditionally, they have been working for, with the West for the last 150 years. So it's very difficult to move away from that uh, mindset. So the same company which belongs to Revolutionary Guard wants to remove sanctions, wants to work mm -hmm. with the Western companies. So, so in a sense, that's like the state has never been homogenous. The state has never been anti-West 100%. Yes, down with the USA in Friday prayer, but then all, all of them were hoping to 
make some rapprochement and remove the sanctions for their own economic interests. So when it comes to 2009, and then the internal green movement happened in Iran, and that's when I joined politics for the first time with the naivety shared with other reformists that the problem is inside Iran and it's authoritarian state. Yeah? And so, and then at the time, Obama didn't help directly, but then they were really hoping to uh, somehow use the green movement as a form, as in order to influence the nuclear negotiation. It goes to 2012 when the sanctions had already started, yeah? And, and so I think Iran somehow budged in 2013. Iran had already started nuclear negotiation secretly behind the scene by Ali Akbar Salehi in Oman in March 2013, but then they stopped it and they waited for presidential election. And presidential election became a referendum in what to do with the West. And a big part of population, especially the younger, more technocratic, more educated middle classes, they voted for Rouhani, who said, uh, we can uh, basically barter our nuclear power with removing sanctions and joining the global, uh, global market. 2013, two years of negotiation by Zarif, and you finally come to JCPOA, yeah? And that's, that's, again, another, I mean, Zarif and many people, they called it the art of rapprochement. They called it like the art of Iranian diplomacy, like almost weaving Iranian carpet. So much boasting about that. And not according to me, but according to Mr. Uh, I think I have to, the head of Iran's National Bank at the time, Mr. Saif, who said that in uh, uh, the Council of Foreign Policy, uh, in the United States, that Iran gained nothing out of JCPOA, nothing. Not a single sanction was removed in action by banks. No banks went, wanted to do anything for Iran. So I think the JCPOA, uh, only Iran was Iran was only allowed to sell its oil. That's that's the best it got. But its access to technology, its access to its frozen as part of a lot of its frozen assets, its ability to revive and restart swift, and none of these things came to action. And so as a result, Iran was dealing with all these problems. And then Trump came, and he uh, kind of he basically hammered the last last nail to the coffin. And so Iran enters the, what you call the maximum pressure warfare yeah? by Bolton, by Pompeo, by Trump, and then put more and more pressure, hoping that inside Iran, the discontent of people turns into riots, into rebel, uh, into like revolution, regime change, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm saying is, this is an interesting point. The pro-Western faction in Iran, I think that was the last gamble, yeah? They did not move away from the West from 2017 or 2018 when Trump tore apart JCPOA and Iran deal. They waited 2018, 2019, 2020. They waited for the next president. Biden came. Biden, again, didn't do anything, didn't make any compromise. Yeah? So it was Washington who basically traumatized Iran, Iranian state, and sent them a very severe signal that we don't want to make a rapprochement with Iran. We only want to destroy Iran. And so for us, even if we come to another deal, it will be temporary for one year, two mm -hmm. years, three years before we, and in order to make your economy, economy conditioned to the West. And then again, we turn that into a weapon against you. So that really affected the dynamic inside the country. And I think at that time, Mr. Khamenei and... Mm -hmm. IRGC and other other the other basically factions inside the state, they took the decision and they did away with Iran's own version of election and its own version of semi-democracy. Yeah? Okay, Iran's democracy is not uh per, is not comparable with a kind of liberal democracy, but nonetheless, as I said, 2013, the two factions came head to head and the pro-Western faction won and changed the direction of the country. And at this stage in 2021, Iran had an election in which 52% of the population uh, did, not did not participate. And Raisi won as the state basically pre-elected candidate and designated candidate in order to solve this problem 
caused by America, but exacerbated by internal fighting between the two factions. Yeah? Because, uh, and after that, when Raisi came, he did two, three things. One, he sold Iranian oil. Instead of waiting for another Iran deal, he said, get away with that. We go to black market, we go to China, we go everything, we sell it cheaper, and we, we, we do anything necessary, but we sell our oil. We want to survive. We are not going to wait for deal with America. Two, he disengaged, not he, but the people who designed his, his government, they disengaged the negotiation with America run by Mr. Bagheri, Ali Bagheri, who had the same, uh, currently he's in charge of foreign ministry after the death of Amir Abdullayan. They disengaged the negotiation with Americans from its public uh, rep representation. Because before that, the negotiation had become a public thing. So every morning, Iran's mm -hmm. bazaar market currency would react to John Kerry and Zarif, whether they are frowning at each other or they are smiling at each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. And they did it all behind the scene. They said, we don't want the West weaponize our own public opinion against us. And we don't want... So in a sense, uh, I think they succeeded to do that. And then slowly... Iranian market's addiction to waiting for a uh, relationship with America and it's con being conditioned to the relation with America or enmity with America has gone away. So in a sense, you have like cured a, a, a sick uh, nation who were so waiting. Everything was hanging on the result of the negotiation with America. I know people were getting married in Iran and they were waiting to see what comes out of Vienna, Lausanne, uh, Geneva uh, agreement or non-agreement. I mean, that was like, for years, Iran lived in purgatory of waiting. The whole 2010 uh, onward, that, that decade in which the GDP gross rate of Iran was 0%. 0%. I mean, if you look at 2010, 2011 to 2020, overall GDP growth of the country was 0%. And the reason was for that was Iran waiting for negotiation to remove the sanction. So Raisi comes and Iran puts the removing sanction option aside and moves to a strategy of neutralization of sanctions. Neutralization of sanctions means we live we do politics, we do economy in a way that sanctions don't affect us. Italy doesn't buy our thing because of sanctions. <laughs> Good riddance. We sell to countries who are willing to work with us. We go to Brazil, we go to yeah. uh, Venezuela. We do barter with them. We work to our, we, we get closer to Russia. Uh, we, we sell it cheaper. We do offshore refineries in African countries yeah, in which we don't have to even sell them oil. We take our oil there, we turn it into product and we sell them the product. Yeah? And so Iran started like uh, creating and engineering solutions to not only bypass the sanctions, but neutralize sanctions as a whole. I think that was the main result of that three years. Second, Raisi joined Shanghai Agreement. Raisi joined BRICS. Yeah? Raisi created Mir Shatab, which was equivalent of SWIFT for a relationship between Iran and yeah. Russia. So Iran and Russia it still is like not fully in action, but, uh, but as this is an important move towards uh, dealing with countries outside the dominance of dollar. And so they work towards de-dollarization and, and, and all these things, I think that was an important move to disentangle and liberate Iran from the shackle of American economic dominance. Yeah? And this is coinciding with a global shift from unipolar moment to multipolar moment. Yeah? Yes. So it is possible to do so. I mean, I do have all my... Uh, in a sense, I, I'm not against the pro-Western faction in Iran. I, I do feel like uh, I share some, I, I do share their depression sentiments because they were uh, world vision uh, yeah. who were hoping to open up to global market, to become globalized. And all these years they felt they're yeah. isolated and they're going backward and being de-developed. But at the same time, and maybe in 90s, they had some rational uh, some some rational point to make but today in this moment in which unipolar world is falling apart their 
continuation on insisting that the only path forward for Iran is to make a detente with America and do it publicly with a vote and with election, I think is suicidal. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing is that for 30 years, globalization meant integrating into the Western-made uh, 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 international system. And now, now globalization, since since one, two years ago, doesn't necessarily mean that anymore. It now means playing with, with several actors. So that's why I, I, I am very, very interested in Iran's position, since it has like 40, 50 years of experience with playing not inside, but next to the Western-made uh, order, right? And... Um, we are running out of time, but we do have in 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 another in another talk, hopefully in a, in a, a little bit of time when you when when you're back from uh, from your travels to talk about this. Um, but in like two or three minutes, where do you see Iran inside the BRICS, where it joined together with Saudi Arabia? Uh, this is, I mean, Iran has huge capacity of like trying to help the others in order to use these new alternative systems. And the West always keeps saying, you know, oh, smuggling or black market. No, it's trading outside of your <laughs> of, of your agreement, which Iran doesn't need because it's a sovereign state, just like the others. And that's that's where I get mad at these at these framings, smuggling or or black market is always a framing of like one one kind of, of of trade that you don't like, but especially when it comes to other states, they have the freedom to do what they want. Um, where do you see now um, Iran inside BRICS developing? I mean, we are, we are seeing uh, mixed signals about Saudis joining BRICS, actually, yeah? because yeah, recently, true. again, true. Saudi apparently withdraw its application for BRICS. Yeah? Mm. But... but it's very interesting because the detente Iran made with Saudi in March 2023, brokered by China, yeah, mm. and I believe it was there before. But between, I mean, China I think came as a guarantor of the deal, whereas Iran and Saudi already wanted that. Yeah, it shows that how much of what we hear in the West in terms of uh, the religious. Uh, factional fights in Islam between Wahhabis, Shiite, all of that, like they withered away, they disappeared, they evaporated overnight. Yeah, both states wanted like uh, to exist in this region, and I think the only uh, actor and, uh, and the only factor which was bringing them into a head-to-head -head war was like. Uh, America's presence here, yeah. America, who had who was selling eighty five billion dollar a year weaponry to to Saudi, of course, didn't want Saudi and Iran to to be in the same line. But Saudi is already moving away from America and knows that America can do with them what it did with other states. And last minute, they can throw them away. So they are seeking to have their security uh, guaranteed through multiplicity of sources, including China, including its own regional stability. And and, and I think Iran is like, again, I mean, Iran uh, is working with Saudi already. It's like developing its economic uh, relationship and ties with with, with Saudis. And, and so in a sense, I think uh, we are seeing the tail, the, the final part of Americans' militaristic presence in this region, especially translated in terms of Israel's genocidal war, yeah? Because America is like, really, is putting whatever it has in support of Israel, and it, Israel has not even won against a small faction of Axis of Resistance called Hamas, yeah? About 240 days later, um, three days ago, Hamas is still is sending rockets to Tel Aviv. Hamas is still uh, uh, taking hostages from American captured soldiers. Captured more so hostages. A, and captured more hostages. So in a sense, it shows America, it shows American weakness. It shows yeah. America as an empire, its weakness in the West Asia. And it's a big question. Does America want to continue, have a strong presence here and pay, I don't know, trillions of dollars for its militaristic, like, I don't know, presence here? Or as they said, famously, they want to tilt to Asia because if they want to do so, they have to accept Iran's role in this region as as one of its main as one of its most uh, important order building countries. Iran is the order maker country, and in this order, Iran 
doesn't want a war with Iraq, doesn't want a war with Saudi, doesn't want a war with any of the countries. And you have to remember, Iran has an attack in other countries in the last 200 years, hasn't initiated a war in the last 200 years. So the order that Iran wants in this region is the ability to sell its product to other countries, import from other countries. But the one who is hampering this and responding this with assassination of Iranian general, with threat of war, with sanctions in America. Iran wants to sell to Iraq. I don't know whether you possibly have never been between the two countries. Yeah, The border there, you cannot even understand. When you leave one country, you enter the other country. And if you want to sell $100 of sweet, Iranian sweet to Iraq, the sanctions come to, to action. So I think the order has to change, and this region has to be left to its own people, whether Saudis or Iraqis or Turks or Iranians. And for that reason, America's hands should be cut off from the region. I support that. We Europeans and the Americans are nothing but but emigrated Europeans, at least the ones who are there at the moment. We should just leave the the other these other places alone because we've been wreaking havoc. Um, Ali uh, uh, Ali Sade, uh, you've been giving me a wonderful like one hour discussion. Thank you very much. Where can people find you who would love to follow you in English? Uh, you're you're muted. They can go to YouTube.com. Uh, slash Jadal, J E D A L, English. And they can find the recent interviews we had. We're going to have more presence in English soon. And uh, I mean, if you want to hear about Iran firsthand, please come and follow us there. I'll put the link in the description. Everybody, please follow Ali Ali, uh, Ali Sadeh. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot, Pascal, for inviting me. Hope to see you soon. Bye.